All right. So, welcome. Thanks for coming today. Uh, what I'm going to be doing today is I'm just going to be going over last semester's midterm. So if you want to follow along, you can pull up on your phone or whatever. It's on Canvas. Um, and then at the end, I'll like talk a little bit about uh, the final and stuff like that. I guess the location is on the board. Um, it's in Huntsman Geo 6. Huntsman spelt wrong. Uh, 12 to 2 p.m. Uh, it's on Friday, 5:10. And if you've never been in Geo 6 because you're not in Wharton, um, or uh, it's just I guess just Geo 6, it's just not everyone goes there. Um, it's near Walnut Street, so that entrance is going to be a lot closer than if you go in through the front door. And McGrath's going to have a review session this weekend, but I'll talk about that stuff at the end. So, all right. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so the fall 2018 midterm uh, from last semester. It's on, yeah, it's on Canvas. Um, so this midterm, I don't think it was particularly difficult, except that like everyone just across the board did really poorly on it. So, uh, and Which I midterm is this? Fall, oh, oh, sorry, final. Why am I saying midterm? Oh. It's the final, it's the final. Yeah, it's the final exam. So, yeah, so everyone did like really poorly which like didn't make really sense, didn't make a lot of sense. So hopefully, uh, once we go through it, uh, we'll see that it's not like a bad exam at all. Um, so number one, all right, what is number one? Uh, essentially, you have this big matrix: two, four, one, eleven, fourteen, one, two, one, eight, ten, four, eight, two, twelve. 18. Okay, so you have this matrix, and the idea you want to find a basis for the column space of A and the kernel of A, or the null space is what the what the problem says on the exam. It's 22 and 28 on the bottom right. Did I write 12? Yeah, you're right, you're right. You're definitely right. Thank you. So, okay, so how do we find basis for column space A and kernel of A? So in this problem, uh, the kernel is going to be, I think, a lot easier to find. Uh, oh, sorry. The column space is going to be a lot easier to find than the kernel. So whenever you see one of these big matrices, and it also applies to uh, your problem for midterm one, what you want to do is you want to see if any rows like add up to be another row, or if there are any like rows that are scalar multiples of the other. Okay, and so if we do that to this matrix right here, uh, you'll notice that the first and the third rows are scalar multiples of each other. Okay, so given that, um, what we can do is I want this in row echelon form, so I'm just going to swap the first two rows: one, two, one, eight, ten; two, four, one, eleven, fourteen. And then, since the third row is a scalar multiple of one of the rows, I'll just zero it out. So it'll be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK, and then I'll just reduce it again uh, to get it into row echelon form uh, or expose the pivots. So now I'll do row 2 minus 2 times row 1, 0, 0. 1 minus 1 is a negative 1. 11 minus 16 is a negative 5. 14 minus 20 is a negative 6. OK. So once you have it like this, you know where the pivots are, and you know where the free variables are. All right, so pivots are in the first and third columns, and the free variables are 2, five, uh, two 4, and 5. OK, so column space. How do we find a basis for the column space of A? Yeah. Isn't it just the two columns in the original matrix? Exactly. Yeah, it's the two columns where the pivots are in the original matrix. So the first column and the third column, right? Uh, so you take this column, you take that column, go back to your original matrix, and then here you go. 
there's your column space of A. So C, C A is equal to the span of uh, 214 and 112. All right, so now let's talk about the null space or the kernel of A. Um, so what we've been doing recently is definitely like not how you find the kernel of like these types of problems because we've just been eyeballing kernels of like three by three matrices, which are a lot easier to do than like eyeballing the kernel of this matrix. So uh, what you actually want to do is you actually want to write out each equation for each line. So for example, row one gets you x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 plus 8x4 plus uh, 10x5, right? And what do, what do you want this equal to? Zero. And then row two gets us negative x3 minus 5x4 minus 6x5 is equal to zero. Okay, so uh, so now what? So now we need to solve for a variable, right? And so we know that x1 and x3 are our pivot variables, so we need to solve for those explicitly. And we'll solve for the row, or we'll solve for x3 first here. So we get x3 is equal to negative 5x4 minus 6x5. And that's simply by moving the x3 over to the right hand side. Okay, now we can work with this row one again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take x3 and I'm going to replace it in the, the row one equation. So now I get x1 plus 2x2 plus negative 5x4 minus 6x5 plus 8x4 plus 10x5 equal to zero. All right, so this is x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x4 plus 4x5 is equal to 0. And now I can solve for x1, which is my other pivot variable. x1 is equal to negative 2x2 minus 3x4 minus 4x5. Okay, so yeah, plug that in there. Okay, so now what? Now, now let's just write what our kernel vector looks like, right? So x1 is negative 2x2 minus, uh, negative 2x2 minus 3x4 minus 4x5, right? x2 is a free variable, so x2 is just x2. x3 is negative 5x4 minus 6x5. And then you have x4 and x5, which are just free variables by themselves. OK, so how do we find a basis for this? We'll just look at each one of the free variables, right? Um, I guess before we even jump to that, how many vectors do I need in my kernel? Three, right, by the rank nullity theorem. So there are five columns, and I have two columns in the column space. So I need three columns in my kernel, all right? Well, luckily for me, there are three free variables, right? So for each free variable, I just go through and read off the coefficients to get my kernel, uh, to get my kernel vectors. So that's equal to the span of, right? And then here, I just read off my x2 coefficients. So negative 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. All right, now I read off my x4 coefficients, negative 3, 0, negative 5, 1, 0. And then I read off my uh, x5 coefficients. So negative 4, 0, negative 6, 0, 1. Okay. And also, for those that came in late, there's food up here. Uh, please eat it. Any questions on this? 
All right. So like theoretically speaking, this should be a really easy problem. My section just couldn't find the kernel for some reason. Like McGrath was great in this problem. And he's like, well, Ivan, your section just can't find kernels. And I was like, yeah, I'm really surprised that they can't find uh, kernels of this matrix. So have your fundamentals down. Um, that's number one. And number two uh, is a problem of the following sorts. So it's like T goes from R4 to R2018, right? And if you're, so if you want to follow along, again, this is the fall 2018 final, and it's on Canvas. Okay, and then what else do we know? Uh, we know that V1, V2, V3, V4 is a basis for R4. Uh, what else do we know? We know that T of V1 is equal to T of V2, and T of V3 is equal to T of V4. And then we also know that T V1 is not a scalar multiple. of T V three and we know that T V three is not a scalar multiple of T V one. All right. And so those last two bullet points like seem really redundant. And last semester, like I remember talking with the instructors and we were like, it does seem redundant, but it's actually needed. And the reason is the following. Um, so First of all, this means that right, TV1 is not equal to K times TV3. So in particular, it's not equal to something where K is 0. So what does that mean? That means TV1 is not the 0 vector. All right? And then this last column means TV3 is not equal to K times TV1. And so in particular, TV3 can't be the 0 vector as well. Okay, so uh, that's why they're actually not redundant, even though they seem like they absolutely are. Okay, so how do we do this problem? Uh, what is the problem asking for? It's asking for the rank of A, and it's asking for the nullity of A, where A is the transformation matrix of T. So maybe I should write it rank T, nullity T. I'm not sure how the problem phrases it. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, first of all, the most important thing is what are the dimensions of this matrix? Yeah, so 2018 by four, right? So that's a big thing to figure out. It's this guy, the dimension of the output by the dimension of the input. Um, don't say it's four by 2018, this is wrong. And, uh, okay, so it's 2018 by 4. So what does that mean? Uh, okay, so what is the rank of A? Well, I know that the columns are going to be like TV1, TV2, TV3, and TV4, right? So if TV1 is equal to TV2 and TV3 is equal to TV4, what does that tell me about the rank of my matrix? Well, it can be at most two, right? So yeah, so rank is at most two since TV1 equals TV2 and TV3 equals TV4. Um, so what this actually means is that the column space, the dimension of the column space is at most two. Right, so that's that's what it actually so that's what we actually want, um, because you have those vectors that are equal to each other. <coughs> okay, and then so you know the dimension of column space is less than or equal to two. So what makes it not less than two? Yes, one and three are linearly independent, and the last two things told us that one and uh, TV one and TV three aren't zero. Right. So yeah. So then. Uh, we know that TV1 and TV3 are linearly independent. 
and that's by the, uh, the TV1 is not scalar multiple. And we also know that TV1 and TV3 are not the zero vectors. So that in particular implies then that the dimension of the column space is equal to two, not less than or equal to two. And so we know that the rank is two, which means that the nullity by the rank nullity theorem is also equal to two. So what if TV1 is the Oh. Yeah. Why is it less um dimension of the column space less than or equal to two? Initially? Uh, it's because we did because we didn't consider uh, so oh, okay. we, we didn't consider the second, the third and fourth lines. This okay. is just after line like so this is applying like line two and then this is like line threes and four yeah the problem said like justify your answer so you had to like come up with some like fluff okay uh number three is this matrix Apparently you guys did this in lecture. Um, so I'm actually not gonna do it here. And also we've done a ton of examples that look like this. Uh, I think this is on your homework? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you have this matrix that essentially find the, null, find the rank on the nullity, find eigenvalues, and then is this refine a diagonal matrix that this is similar to, right? So uh, there's a homework problem. We have the solutions written up. I'm just going to skip this if that's okay with everyone. Um, okay, number four is a really simple Diffie Q. All right. Y double prime plus 2Y prime plus Y is equal to 5E to the negative T. I'm going to set it up. I didn't solve for the homogeneous, uh, the particular constant, but it shouldn't be that bad. So, uh, right, the homogeneous, this is d plus 1 squared, apply to y is equal to 0. So r is going to be negative 1 multiplicity 2. Okay. And then y homogeneous is c1 e to the negative t plus c2 t e to the negative t. Now we look at the particular. Um, okay, so what is the particular? So the annihilator is what? D plus one. Yeah, so please use the annihilator for this problem. Don't like variation parameters it uh, or reduction of order it. I guess you can reduction of order it, but because the annihilator is D plus one, which means if I go back to my original equation, I'll get D plus one cubed is equal to, apply to Y is equal to zero. Right? So now I get Y is equal to C1 e to the negative T plus C2 <laughs> e to the uh, t e to the negative t plus c3 t squared e to the negative t. And this is my new term, so this is my particular. Okay, so we guess that yp is equal to some constant c t squared e to the negative t, and then we plug this back in. this equation up here, and we solve for C. Okay, fairly standard stuff, fairly easy stuff, because we just literally just did this. I think, like, the one on our midterm is a lot harder than the one on here, right? I think, because 
there's three terms. Okay. Number five. <coughs> so you're told the following information. Um, T of 111 is equal to x. T of 110 is equal to 2x squared. And T of 101 is equal to x plus x squared. All right, and you want to find T. Or you want to find T of 1, 2, 3. Okay. And another information, I mean, it, it's pretty clear from uh, what's given to you that it's a transformation from R3 to the polynomials P2. Okay, so what's one way we can do this problem? Um, so one way we can do this problem is the following. Uh, so we know that like T of one, so we want to rewrite x two x squared and x plus x squared. We want to write them as like column vectors essentially, uh, because we're trying to find a matrix of transformation, right? So in particular, then you have that T of one 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 is equal to like zero one zero, right? And remember how we vectorized uh, polynomials. This is like the constant. This is the x term, and this is the x squared term. And then we have t of 1, 1, 0 is equal to 0, 0, 2. And then t of 1, 0, 1 is equal to uh, 0, 1, 1. OK. So one way we can do it to find t is the following. Um, if I actually write it out like this, if I just take t of 1, 1, 1, and that's equal to 0, 1, 0, OK? And then I can take the next column, 1, 1, 0, and that's going to be equal to 0, 0, 2. And if I take 1, 0, 1, then t of 1, 0, 1 is equal to 0, 1, 1. So this setup is actually perfectly correct. OK, and what can I do after this? Now I can just take an inverse, right? Multiply on the right-hand side, and I'll be able to find t. So I get t is equal to 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, times 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, inverted. Okay, so I'm actually not going to calculate this. This is a perfectly correct way to do it. Find the inverse of that matrix. Take your matrix multiplication. You'll get T. But what we can do instead is that we can abuse the fact that linear transformations are in fact linear. So what, what does that mean? So essentially T of 1, 2, 3 is equal to T of 1, 0, 0 plus 2t of 0, 1, 0 plus 3t of 0, 0, 1. Right? And this is just because they're linear transformations. Remember, you can take the scalar and you can multiply it back into the vector, and then you can just like add the vector up and like undistribute the t's. Okay? So I can do this because this is a linear transformation. And now I can try to find what the hell t of 1, 0, 0, t of 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 are. Right? So what is t of 1, 0, 0? What is t of 0, 1, 0? And what's t of 0, 0, 1? OK. So t of 1, 0, 0 is actually the hardest one to find. Um, but if you just look at the ones up here, can you find t of 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1? Yeah, so <laughs> what is one of them? Anyone? <laughs> exactly. 
So t of 0, 1, 0 is t of 1, 1, 1 minus, right, 1, 0, 1. So then that's t of 1, 1, 1 minus t of 1, 0, 1, which is t of 1, 1, 1 is x, and t of 1, 0, 1 is x minus x squared, x plus x squared. So t of 0, 1, 0 is negative x squared. All right, what about t of 0, 0, 1? Yeah, so this is t111 minus t110, which is x minus, I think, 2x squared. All right, so we have one of them. Here's another one. And then t of 100, what is that one? Okay, that's that's the hard way to do it. That's the medium way to do it. <laughs> it's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. I mean, you already have t of zero one zero one zero and t of zero zero one. You can add those together to track that to t of one one. Well, that, hey, that's what Leah just said. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the easy way to do it is I can just take t of like one one zero and subtract t of zero one zero. Right. This was, this one's the easiest way to do it because you are, you're only like doing one calculation versus like two. I mean, all of your ways are completely correct, and you probably and you will get the right answer. It's just that this one minimizes like the amount of mistakes we can make. Uh, in arithmetic, and so this is equal to 2x squared minus uh, a negative x squared, so that's 3x squared. Okay? So now what we want to do is just plug them in. I'm not going to do that, but... Plug them in and you're done. Yeah. Is there a reason you can just multiply the inverse? Is that like, you can like multiply two, make it together, and then apply it to apply t to them? Like, why can't you just? So t is a matrix by itself. Oh, right, right. Okay. Right? So uh, here, I'm just trying to isolate what t is. Yeah. OK. Uh, number six. So now let me pull it up on Canvas. Um, so we're not going to do number six. And if you, look at, if you look at what number six is, it's a matrix on midterm three. All right, in fact, it's the exact same system of equations matrix. He literally just jacked it from the final and just put it on your midterm. Um, so the only thing that's different is that there's like a limit as t approaches infinity, but we all know how to do that. You just look at the sign on e to the whatever, right? Uh, so, so what is the solve a system of differential equations, and then oh. the matrix is literally the one you had on your midterm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Number seven. Okay, so uh, so you have two bases in P two R. B is one plus x plus x squared. One plus x. One plus x squared. C is two plus two x plus three x squared. Negative two minus x minus x squared. Negative one plus x plus two x squared. I'm going to run the milk to the fridge.
Uh, problem seven just asks you to find the change of basis matrix from P C to B. All right, so this shouldn't be too bad of a problem. Um, so if you don't remember like which way you're supposed to set up like that augmented matrix, um, remember what the definition of P, uh, P C to B was, right? It's essentially C1 written in terms of B, C2 written as the coordinates of B, and C3 written as the coordinates of B. Okay. So what does this really mean? It just means that, okay, um, C1 in written coordinates of B is essentially, you have like B1, B2, B3, and then you have like X1, X2, X3. So, ah, sorry. So, no, this is just C1, right? So this unknown vector right here, this is C1 written in terms of B. Right, and the same thing for like C2 and C3, right? It's just B1, B2, B3, and then you have like x1, x2, x3, and now this is like c2 written in terms of b. So what's going on is that we're having this system of equations where you're having like b1, b2, b3, right? And then you want this multiplying by some unknowns to get you c1, and then you want b1, b2, b3 multiplying some unknowns to get you c2, and then you want b1, b2, b3 equals uh, some unknowns, right, times some unknowns is equal to c3. So now you get this matrix and you see that, hey, it's the exact same direction as this arrow is going from c to b, right? And so, all right, so what is b1? So now let's just actually like write this matrix out. So b1 is 1, 1, 1, b2 is 1, 1, 0, and B3 is 1, 0, 1. And then C1 is 2, 2, 3. C2 is negative 2, negative 1, negative 1. And C3 is negative 1, 1, 2. Okay, and remember how do we solve for this? Uh, we want to reduce it until we get the identity matrix on the left-hand side. So now we'll just go on a journey down row reducing lane. And we'll get 1, 1, 1, 2, negative 1, 2, negative 2, negative 1. All right, um, I'm going to subtract row 2 minus row 1 and row 3 minus row 1. So 0, 0, negative 1. 0, 1, 2, and then 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 1, 3. Okay, now I'm going to move and multiply by negative 1. So 0, 1, 0, this row is negative 1, negative 1, negative 3, and then this row is 0, negative 1, negative 2. 2, negative 2, negative 1. Okay, and then finally, I'll get the identity matrix on the left. And here, well, I'll write down my last two rows first. Okay, and then 2 minus negative 1 minus 0. So that's positive 3, 2 plus 1. Negative 2 minus negative 1 minus negative 1. Well, that's negative 2 plus 2. And then negative 1 minus negative 3 minus negative 2. One, negative 1 plus 5 is 4. So there's my change of basis matrix.
All right, ring some bells for midterm two. Yeah. Okay. Problem eight. Uh, it's Cauchy orderly and homogeneous. T squared, y double prime, plus 2ty prime, minus 2y is equal to t squared, and t is bigger than 0. So last semester we didn't cover Cauchy Euler. <laughs> like, it wasn't a cover topic in class, but then, like, these kinds of diffy Qs showed up, like, on the midterm and the final, anyways. And I guess just like no one knew how to do these, uh, so it was a disaster. Um, well, it's inhomogeneous, right? So you have to solve the homogeneous first, and then you have to use reduction of order to get the get the particular uh, get the entire thing, right? So you use so the the problem actually says first find a solution you, uh, to the homogeneous, and then use reduction of order. No, 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 no. OK, so we, we can walk through this, um, which, which was why I was going to do it. So uh, let's see. OK, so this is a cauchy euler and homogeneous equation. So what you want to do first is you want to solve the homogeneous, like usual. All right, so the homogeneous is t squared y double prime plus 2ty prime minus 2y is equal to 0. Right, and then if you plug in y is equal to t to the r into here and you take your derivatives, you'll get r <laughs> times r minus 1 plus 2r minus 2 is equal to 0. Okay, and so what is this? This is r squared plus r minus 2 is equal to 0. So r minus 1, r plus 2 is equal to 0, and r is equal to negative 2 and positive 1. So your homogeneous is c1 e to the negative 2, ah, not e, t to the negative 2, and then plus c2 times just t. Okay, but now that you have the homogeneous solution, right, we can use reduction of order using one of the homogeneous solutions as like by y1. Okay, so now we want a reduction of order uh, where y is equal to u times y1, right? And in particular, in this problem, just let y1 equal either t to the negative 2 or t. Right? And it's actually really easy if you let it be t. So y is equal to u times t. And now uh, y prime is u prime t plus u. And y double prime, u double prime t plus u prime plus u prime. All right, so product rule on the first terms. Uh, you don't have to do that for the u. OK, so now you plug it in, right? And you get your first order differential equation. So you plug this into the, uh, you plug all this into the original Diffie-Q. And you should get the following first order Diffie Q uh, u double prime plus 4 over t u prime is equal to 1 over t. Yeah. When you plug it back into the original, are you ignoring the t's? No, you want to ignore the u's. Yeah, 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 you want to ignore the u's. Um, so that's because your unknown is the u here, right? We know what, so we know what the t's are, 
but our, our guess was u1, y1, and t is y1, right? So you don't want to just get rid of the solution that you have already. Uh, what instead we're trying to solve for are the u's. And so uh, reduction of order essentially takes the u's and instead of being like a second order differential equation, it eliminates the regular u's. So then you have u double prime plus u prime. And this is a first order differential equation because you don't have like a u term, right? You only have the double prime and the single prime. Yeah, so you want to ignore the u, not the, not the t's. <coughs> and in this problem, it's actually like not that bad. If you plug the u's in, you'll see that they cancel out like pretty quickly. Okay. So that's the first order differential equation. And then if you solve this, you'll get u is equal to 1 fourth t plus c1, t to the negative 3 plus c2. And then you can find y, which is t times all of this stuff right here. You should. Um, that's because uh, the reason why you come out with two constants is because it, reduction of order returns the general solution, right? And if you have a second order ODE, right, you have two homogeneous terms, right? So then you should have two constants. All right, so I think I have time for one more. Uh, let's see, number nine. Oh, wait, let's do number nine. So number nine's on the board, um, but it's like 16, negative 21, 10, negative 13, times 7, 5 is equal to 7, 5, and 16, negative 21, 10, negative 13, times 3, 2 is equal to 6, 4. So you want to find uh, all entries of 16, negative 21, 10, negative 13 raised to the 2018 power, right? And so if you see something like this on this exam, it'll be raised to the 2019 power. But OK, so whenever you see a matrix power, and especially if you see like some really dumb like matrix power, uh, you should always just think of like eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Uh, so, yeah, so A to the 2018 is going to be equal to S, J to the 2018 times S inverse. And remember, J, this could also be D. J is equal to D if diagonalizable. So, uh, that's what we have. Okay, so how do we find eigenvalues eigenvectors? Well, somehow these two information, <coughs> these two equations up here should give me what the eigenvalues eigenvectors are, right? And I have it spoiled on the board, but essentially what's going on is in this first equation, this is essentially A times V is equal to V, right? And in particular, this is like, 1 times v. So we know then for lambda equals 1, v is equal to 7, 5. Same thing over here. This is a times v is equal to 2v. <coughs> and now we know for lambda equals 2, we got v is equal to 3, 2. Okay, so now what? So now I have all my eigenvalues and I have all my eigenvectors, so I can piece it together, right? So now I know that a to the 2018 is equal to 7, 5, 3, 2 times, all right, 7, 5 goes with 1, 3, 2 goes with 2. Raised to the 2018, and now I need to find 7, 5, 7 3, 5, 2 inverted. Okay. On this exam, compute all entries or find all entries 
uh, you you have to multiply this out. So you can leave like this as like two to the twenty eighteen. Like that's fine. Um, but just know that you had to calculate this inverse, which is not too bad. And uh, you have to multiply all three matrices. But I'm not going to do that just to save some time. All right, so multiply out. And yeah, if on the exam, for some reason, you have like 5 to the 2019 or something that looks like that, just leave it as 5 to the 2019 uh, because we obviously don't expect you to know what that is. Okay, number 10 is this DiffEQ system. So I'm not going to solve it, um, but the hint was the hint was eliminate uh, one of the variables using x or y. Well, yeah. So eliminate one of the variables, uh, and the variable you probably want to eliminate in this problem is why okay and that's because it's the following right this is the first row is d minus 4 apply to x plus d squared apply to y is equal to t squared and then the second row is d plus 1 apply to x plus d apply to y so what we can do is just uh, apply D to the bottom, right? And then subtract the two terms. So if I apply D, and then this becomes D squared, and then I have to apply D to zero, but that's just zero, right? And then I subtract, what do I get? I get D minus four X minus d times d plus 1 x is equal to t squared, right? And the y's cancel. Right? And now I have a different, now I have a diffy q in x. All right? And then you can solve for x, solve for the diffy q in terms of x, and then use one of those relationships up here to solve for y. Okay, uh, so I did. I got a number eleven last last class, but I'm not going to get it here because uh, it's nine fifty. So I'm just going to wrap it up. But number eleven is a linear transformation problem um, about trace, and we actually did this problem I think in recitation uh, during the linear transformation section. Um, yeah, so uh, number eleven, I'm pretty sure did in recitation. When we had the uh, when we had the linear transformation stuff, I think. So, all right, yeah. So let's so a few announcements. Then let me just talk about uh, a few things that I want to talk about. Um, so again, there's the location of the exam: Huntsman Geo 6, 12 to 2 p.m. Friday, May 10th. Uh, enter through Walnut if you can. I'm not sure if it's going to be locked that day. Probably not. So you can enter through a Walnut exit entrance that's literally right there if you enter through Walnut. Um, okay, Professor McGrath is going to have a review session. At least he told me he's going to have a review session this weekend. Uh, so details to be like said soon. Uh, what else? So I have uh, so office hours and review sessions. We're going to have a ton of those. So we're going to post them on Piazza. Like so, I'm going to have like the big post of like all the like stuff that you should be doing uh, or like all the what do you call it resources for the final um, as for the final we're going to be doing some extra credit problems starting I think today so what's going to happen is that on canvas you're just going to get like problems that you can like do and then you can turn in on canvas uh, for extra credit so for example today what we're going to do is I'm going to type up uh, Lichtenfels's first midterm I'm just going to post it on canvas and his midterms are all like multiple choice anyways so you can do the problems and then submit them as multiple choice. 
and they'll be counted as extra credit. Uh, we're going to use extra credit to help us uh, like curve the class at the end. So it will just like the only thing it will do is benefit you. And I think for this first one, you'll have until I think tomorrow midnight to like do it. All right. And so the idea is just to get you studying for the final earlier. Hopefully, it's enough of an incentive to get you to study for the final earlier. Because as you can tell from this midterm, uh, from this final from last semester, like it's not like that bad. Plus, they got a cheat sheet, and the grids were abysmal on the final. So um, hopefully, like getting you guys to study it earlier will be like a little easier. Uh, will be a little better than that. As for a cheat sheet. Not sure if you're going to get one on the final. So I think McGrath is actually pushing for no cheat sheet on the final, which is beneficial to you guys because you guys like haven't been using cheat sheets like all semester. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I think that is it. So thanks everyone for coming. Please take some food uh, if you haven't already. Uh, yeah, I think some other announcements. I told people to take me out to lunch earlier this semester, and I had one person do it. So I'm still open to that if you guys have time. I think the link is on my website. And then, uh, yeah, I think this is actually my last recitation at Penn. So uh, it's been great TA for six semesters. So thank you very much. Um, uh, it's been a lot of fun. So if I don't see you around before finals, good luck. Uh, but otherwise, if I see you at office hours, uh, I'll just see you.